Hello all and welcome to the fifth Funk Prog Sweden. We're so happy that this time we are live from a TV studio actually in Stockholm. So we don't have any audience, we just have the speakers and some studio people here. So welcome all on the YouTube. So the agenda today, I'll do a short intro, that's what we're doing now. And then we'll do a presentation on closure by closure in a nutshell by James Trunk. And then we do a second presentation, Polylith, the last architecture you will ever need by Joachim and Furkin. And then last guy up is Emil. He's going to talk a little bit about Rust and what Rust borrowed from Functional. Yes, so why did I start this community? Funk Prog Sweden, because we love functional programming. We're open and inclusive. We want to spread functional so everyone will do functional programming in the end. We also like to share, hence we are here and hence we're streaming to you over YouTube. So let's have fun and spread functional programming. And speakers and sponsors. If you have anything to present around functional, it doesn't need to be in a functional language. We had one Harald from the C++ community coming over and, and talking about C++ and how what it does in functional programming, so please come. Also, if you have a venue you could share once the corona madness is over, please come to us. Um, so just contact me and reach out to me, Magnus, or the other organizers, Tien and Matthias. And last but not least, how to 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 today as we live stream please ask any questions in the youtube chat that you have and we'll send it over to the presenters so let's start so i will introduce closure in a nutshell by james trunk welcome thank you very much magnus you're warm welcome i'll take that from you yep let's see if the technology works Hi everyone, hopefully you can see the slides now. Uh, my name is James and I'm here to give you a brief introduction to Clojure. And uh, we're going to start by exploring Clojure uh, through the lens of the design philosophy that is behind the language. And that's because I found that understanding why something is the way it is often gives a lot more value than just understanding uh, what it is or how that it works. And then once we've done a little bit of that uh, philosophical discussion, we'll finish with a little bit of live coding. I'm a bit nervous about that, but we'll see how it goes. And uh, the idea there is to put uh, some of the theory that hopefully you, you've been learning into practice and give you a little bit of an impression of what it feels like to create solutions with Clojure. Okay, so let's dive in. So design is separating into things that can be composed. Uh, Rich Hickey, he's the creator of Clojure, and I, I think this quote is perhaps the perfect place for us to start in our journey of trying to understand uh, Rich and how he thinks, and especially his creation. And what I think this quote tells us is that Rich really values separating ideas uh, that should be untangled, but giving us tools that allow us to combine them back together into simple solutions. So let's have a look at how he puts that into practice. And the first idea we're going to cover that Clojure has as a base philosophy is that it separates data from functionality. It does this by elevating data to a first-class citizenship within the language. Uh, and it encourages you to build your solutions using pure functions that work on that data. You could say, in a way, that Clojure is the antithesis or the opposite of object-oriented programming where the fundamental idea there is to tangle up those two concepts of data and functionality into objects, whereas Clojure wants to split those apart. But why is that? When you combine two pieces of data, you get data. When you combine two machines, you get trouble. If you only remember one thing from my talk, I really want it to be this quote. Uh, write it down, take a screenshot, ask Siri to take a note for you, uh, and then promise me that you're going to come back later and reread this and just give it a couple of minutes to ruminate on it, to ponder it, and think about why Rich is, is right here and why this is quite a profound way of thinking differently about writing programs. When you understand this idea, 
then you'll understand the brilliance of promoting data up to the syntax level of your language. And then why giving a huge toolkit of functions to work with that data um, is the right way to do things. And that's exactly what Clojure does. So let's have a little look at how does data as syntax look like. So here are the four core data structures that Clojure offers. Uh, lists, vectors, maps, and sets. And as you can see, lists have the, the syntax of using parentheses, vectors, square brackets, maps, curly braces, and sets have a hash in front of the curly brace. And you might also notice that there are no commas separating the elements. That's because in Clojure, a comma is treated as white space. So that means it's fully optional if you put it there or not. Uh, most uh, coding standards or guidelines would recommend not to put it for lists but to use them just as a visual separator when you have key value pairs in maps, as you see here on the third line. So what does this mean when we have data as syntax? It means that we visualize our data, we bring it to the forefront, and it makes it easier to think about, to talk about, to communicate to each other, and to work with. Not only that, but it also makes it easier to construct nested data, which is, of course, the main kind of data that we work with with our systems. Here we have an example uh, vector that contains three maps, and each map contains three key value pairs, and one of those values is a vector itself. And what I want you to notice is how clearly we see the shape of the data, uh, and, and think about how hard it is to see the shape of data when you're using the program, when you're using code to construct rather than syntax. You just don't see it, right? It's, it's lost in the code. I, I think there's a reason why JSON has taken over the world in terms of communicating data. And you can think of Clojure's data syntax as JSON with superpowers. One of those superpowers is that Clojure's code itself is data. So Clojure doesn't stop with making the system data easy to visualize and to reason about and to work with. It takes the perhaps heretical, but uh, I believe inspired next step to represent the code itself as data, as a data structure. Uh, that's because Clojure is a LISP. Uh, LISP, stands, LISP stands for list processor. So you can probably guess which data structure it uses to represent its code. That's right, it uses lists. And here's how a function call is represented as a list enclosure where the function is always the first element in the list, and the arguments are the rest of the elements in the list. And this is called prefix notation. And what, what's good about it is it simplifies the syntax, because you can, it means that the language is 100% consistent in the order of precedence. There's no book that you need to learn that in this case, you put the, the operator or the function here, and in this other case, it goes there. It's always at the front of the list. So let's see some examples of how that looks like. So when we want to add numbers together, you put the function at the front of the list. When we want to find the max of a group of numbers, you put the function at the front of the list, and the arguments follow. And of course, you can have as many arguments passed to these as you want. When we're filtering a collection, here we use a predicate function called odd that filters out the odd numbers from the vector. Again, filter goes at the front, and then you pass, uh, in this case, a um, a function is the first argument. And then when we're doing conditionals, it's the same. If goes at the front, then we have a nested list. That's the, that's the important thing to notice about this piece of code. Uh, so the way it works with Clojure is when you have nested data structures in the code, so nested lists, you always evaluate from the deepest nest, nested list first. So he would evaluate that one is less than two. So it's true, that predicate. And therefore, we, the, this conditional will return A rather than B. Okay, here's another quote. Nobody wants to program with mutable strings anymore. Why do you want to program with mutable collections? You've probably noticed already that I like quotes. Uh, that's because I think at their best, they have an almost magical ability to distill a lifetime's worth of wisdom and knowledge into a bite-sized piece of clarity. And I think the particular insight with this quote is that Rich is saying, we've already solved how to make our programs stable to build upon? And the answer is building on immutable data. And in Clojure, all the collections are immutable by default. 
And I think this is something that our industry has started to wake up to. Of course, you, you get immutable data structures in most languages now. But where I think Clojure is different is that it did that right from the beginning. It's a core part of the language. And it's not been added as an afterthought or as a library. So that changes how those data structures are and how people code by default in Clojure in a good way. So let's get a feeling for what it's like to work with these immutable collections, starting with strings. So here what we're doing is we're defining a string with the name first name. And we're giving it the value Dave. And as you see, it's in the list. And def is how you define. And that goes first. And then you pass the arguments just as before. So you already understand closure, right? That's kind of cool. And then if we're going to manipulate that string, so in this case, we're concatenating it with another string, I'm sorry. And that outputs, I'm sorry, Dave, as expected. But we haven't changed first name. The value of first name is and always will be Dave. And that's pretty common in most languages. That's, that's how we do strings now. Mutable strings aren't really a thing. But where closure is different is all of the other uh, collections working just the same way. So here's an example where we've constructed a vector with three elements. We've called it ages. It has three integers in the vector. And then we, when we conjoin a new uh, element onto the end, 21, that outputs a vector, but it's a new vector, just like we had a new string. And if we look at what's in ages, it hasn't changed. And that gives us this stable base to build upon. It means that there's not a shifting sand of mutability underneath ev everything that we're building. So what does Rich think the problem with mutability is? So eventually, with mutable objects, you create an intractable mess. And encapsulation does not get rid of that. Encapsulation only means, well, I am in charge of this mess. So what have we learned so far? Closure separates data from functionality. Closure visualizes our data. It brings it to the front. It makes it a first-class citizen when we're working with our code. Closure code itself is data. And closure collections are immutable by default. And all of these four properties combined are normally what people mean when they say that closure is data oriented. What it means is closure puts data front and center when we're building our systems, when we're writing our code, when we're talking about it with our uh, fellow developers. And it changes the way you think about building systems. And it enables us to build fundamentally simpler solutions. OK. So that's the basics of Clojure's design philosophy. But before we hop over into the live coding part of this, I wanted to teach you a couple of pieces of syntax just so it's easier for you to follow along if you haven't seen Clojure before. So here, we're defining a function called greetings, uh, which takes a single argument called name, and it concatenates it in fr uh, after the, the string hello. And you'll see that this looks very similar to when we were defining values. You define functions in essentially the same way. However, because creating functions is so common uh, when you're writing code, right? Well, that's what we do for the most part when we're writing functional approach. Clojure actually has some syntactic sugar to simplify and shorten and reduce the, the nesting uh, for when we're uh, making our functions. So this is the exact same definition, but here we're using def n instead of def. And you can th think about reading that as define function instead of define. So it's def and greetings name, uh, and then the same implementation. So what we've essentially done is, is shortened how much we need to read and understand each time that we define a function. So that's good to know, because we'll be defining some functions later. And then using that, you already know the rule, right? You put it in a list. The function call goes first. Then you follow it with the arguments, in this case, a single argument. And it would output, hello, Dave. So our custom functions are treated in just the same way as the core functions in the language. I think one of the things that can be a little bit upsetting when you're first reading a Lisp code, and Clojure is no different as it is a Lisp, is when you get uh, quite a lot of uh, nesting going on in the code. So this is, has three nested function calls. And how you would read this is, like I said, from the inside out. So we'd start by evaluating range 5, which would give us a sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
Then we apply the increment function with map. So we map it across each of the elements in, in the sequence, giving us one, two, three, four, five. And then we filter using the odd predicate, so only letting the odd numbers through in the end, which gives us the output one, three, and five. But it feels a little bit unnatural, especially when you're getting used to reading code that way. It feels a bit, oh. And I think that's because, in English at least, that's not how we think and read and write. Uh, we tend to read left to right, not right to left. And we tend to read top to bottom. But Clojure has a trick up its sleeve, a trick that is called uh, thread last. And thread last is, is a macro um, that changes the order of the code, essentially, and lets you flip it. And it's an arrow with two heads. You would see it here. It's, this is a ligature version, but it's just a dash with two uh, chevrons. And what happens here is we can put range 5 first. We see the output, like I said, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then that gets piped or threaded into the next function call uh, in the last position. That's why this is thread last. Uh, and then finally, it gets threaded into the filter at the end. And if you haven't seen this before, it might be a bit confusing. But if you've ever used Unix, you might know uh, the pipe when you pipe the output of one command into the input of the next. And that's essentially what we're doing here. It's called thread, but it's essentially the same. And like I said, commas are treated as white space. But the output of executing range 5 gets placed into where those commas are on mapping into the last position, and the output of mapping into the last on filter. I hope that makes sense, because we're going to use this quite a bit. Great, one last quote. Systems are dynamic and data-driven. It might be a nice idea to use a language that is also dynamic and data-driven. So I, I want to show you what it feels like. Of course, we're not going to build a whole system, and we're just going to do a bit of uh, noddy examples, really. But it still, hopefully, will give you a feeling of those properties that we talked about, the design philosophy behind Clojure. How does that impact when you're working with code and shaping algorithms? So let's jump over and do that. Let me just flip into mirror mode. Excuse me one second. OK. Live coding, not terrifying at all, right? So let's see if we have the REPL up and running. So we will send plus one, two to the REPL, and we get three back. Shall I zoom in a tiny bit more, maybe, just so it's even easier for you guys to see? That's hopefully is big enough. And if you're watching on a mobile phone, then I'm afraid you only have yourself to blame. Wait until you get home and watch it on the big screen. OK, so what's happened here? Like I said, it's a list. The first element is the function. Then we pass the arguments, and we're returning three, right? That's nice and simple. But what I'm going to show you in, in this example is uh, some textual analysis. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a book. And we're going to read in a file. And one of my favorite names functions is a function called slurp. I just think it sounds so delicious. And we're going to slurp in a book from the Project Gutenberg. And it's quite a big book, so we'll see how long this takes to load. And what Slurp does is it reads a file, either from the local uh, file system or remotely, as you see here, and it converts it into a string. So we've now set the value of the book symbol to be a string of the book. But if we're going to do some analysis on it, we're going to want to break that out into the words in the book as a separate sequence. There are a couple of ways we could do this. Uh, one way is to use like string functions and split them based on spaces. But in fact, we're going to do a regular expression. There's a function called reseq that does a matching pattern uh, and, and outputs a sequence that matches that regular expression. And I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, but if you have a problem and you solve it with a regular expression, now you have two problems. So that's basically what we're doing here. So what we're going to match it on is word characters or quotes. So anytime we see an A, B, C all the way to Z, or a 0 to 9, or I think underscore. That's a word character, and any quote or apostrophe so that we get possessives. And let's run that across the whole book. Hopefully that will work. OK, and let's count how many words we have. And that might give us an idea about what book we're looking at. 220,391 words. If someone knows what the book is just based on the word count, I'll be impressed. But let's take the first 20 of those words, and that might tell us what the title is. So 
It's Moby Dick or the Whale by Herman Melville. So let's do some analysis on Moby Dick. So the first thing we're going to try and find out are what are the 20 most frequently used words in this book? And we're going to use the thread last macro, the one that I just explained to you what it is and how it works. So hopefully you can follow along. So we're going to take the words. And there's another really useful uh, core function that's called frequencies enclosure. And if we read the text, it's a bit small here, but it says, returns a map from distinct items in collection to the number of times they appear, which sounds almost exactly like what we want. So let's run that. That might take a while because it's a big book. So here we've got a map, and it's the, the word and then the, the frequency that it appears in the book. And I already see a problem here because lower is ironically not lowercase, it's uppercase. So what we're probably going to want to do is use uh, closure.string slash lowercase. So this function takes a string and outputs the lowercase version of that string. But of course, with words, we have a sequence of 220,000 strings. So we can't just run this once. We have to map that function across all of the entries in the sequence. Let's see if that fixed our problem with uppercase. Yeah, that looks good. And like I said, uh, when I briefly introduced uh, functions, but th this is what's called a higher order function. So what happens is, uh, as well as functions as well can take data or they can take functions. So this is a higher order one that takes the lowercase. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to sort this so that we can figure out which are the most frequently used ones. And if we just do a standard sort, it's going to sort them alphabetically. So we want to give it another uh, function to sort by. And because we had a map, we know we have keys and values. So if we sort by keys, it's going to sort alphabetically. But what we're going to do is sort by the value, because the value was the frequency. So hopefully this will give us in order. Yes, so these are the, the words that only appear once. And then the last ones of this list should hopefully be the most frequently used one. So let's take the last, say, 20, because that's what we were aiming for. And here are the 20 most commonly used words in Moby Dick. However, these are very, very boring because these would be the 20 most commonly used words in most English works, especially at this length. So what we're actually going to do is try and make this a bit more interesting. We're going to define a value called common words, and it's going to be the set of common words in the English language. And I had prepared that one earlier, so we paste that in. And here you start to get a feeling for what it's like when you bring uh, the, the data and the data structures up to the front to be first class because we see the shape of this data, right? Okay, so now we have those common words. So what we want to do now is after we've done the lowercase, we want to remove those words out of the, the collection. Common words. So let's run that and hopefully we'll get a different result. Yes, this looks promising. And what's happening here? Maybe this is interesting. How did it work that we could pass a set into the remove function? So let me just take a quick detour to explain what's happening there. When we have a set, so let's say we have a set that contains one, two, and three, Clojure can treat that as a function itself. So if we say and pass that the argument one, what it's going to do is return one if that's in the set. And if we pass four, which is not in the set, it will return nil. And in Clojure, one or any value is a truthy value. So that means that if we're filtering or removing on it, it, it will um, exist, and nil is a false or falsey value. So in this case, uh, when the common words are in this list, they get removed. So that's how that works. So let's have one more look at what these were then. Okay, so drum roll, the number one used word in uh, Moby Dick is whale, perhaps unsurprisingly. We have ye and Ahab and ship. Oh, thank you. How kind. And see a man, and perhaps this isn't too surprising. But what I want you to start to see here is just how close the, the solution that I've described is to maybe how you would start to think about describing this to someone else in words if you were doing some kind of pseudocode uh, description of what we're doing. So let's just read it out. So we take the words, uh, we map them to lowercase, we remove the common words, we calculate the frequencies, we sort those by the frequency, or the val in this case, and then we take the last 20.
And I also want you to notice how much it feels like playing with Lego. What we're doing is just combining different functions that all know how to work on these sequences, these data structures that have this first-class citizenship within Clojure. Uh, and it, it becomes that, that, uh, that act of molding the software. And, and you see how using a REPL gives you this instant feedback as you're working on it. So you spot things as you go, and you can improve and tweak your algorithms as you build them. Great. So let's see how that would be slightly different if instead of doing the 20 most frequently used words, let's find the longest words. And what we probably want to do here to start with is reduce the, the problem space a little bit. So instead of doing this over all 220,000 words, let's find the set of words. So distinct returns a lazy sequence of the elements of the collection with duplicates removed. So that's exactly what we want to do. And then once we have the set or the distinct, then we can sort them by uh, the count. So let me just show you why this is working. So if we uh, use the count function on a string, it's going to return the number of characters in the string. Because internally, you can think of closure as representing a string as a sequence of characters. So when we sort by the count here, it's going to count each one and then sort them by that, which should be exactly what we want. Yeah, so these are all single letter, so let's then take the last 20 of these. And these should be the 20 longest words in the book. Oh, there's some good words here. Supernaturalness, the longest word is uninterpenetratingly. That's a very good word. Uh, and let's do one more thing. So let's see exactly how many characters each one of these have. So we'll use the group by function, and we'll group by the count this time. And that way, what it's going to do is count each of these and then put them in a, in a vector for all of the ones that have that number of characters. So these are all the ones with 16. And we see that the longest word in Moby Dick has 20 letters or 20 characters. Pretty cool. OK, one last little thing that we're going to do then is find the longest palindrome in Moby Dick. So hopefully you all know what a palindrome is. But if you don't, I can teach you now. One of my favorite palindromes is the word race car. So a palindrome is a word that's the same backwards and forwards. So what we're going to do is create a little helper function called palindrome question mark. And this is going to take any collection and return true if it's a palindrome and false if it isn't. So as a palindrome is the, the same thing forwards and backwards, the easiest way to do this in Clojure, I think, is if we compare the collection to the reverse of the collection. Let's execute that and do some tests. Again, the great thing about using a REPL is that we can test as we go. So if we pass in a vector, 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1, that should be a palindrome. It is. And then let's try with a string. Race car should also be a palindrome. And it isn't. And that's interesting. So why is that not a palindrome? The, the secret here is how the reverse function works with the string enclosure. So if we pass in race car to reverse, what we see is we get a sequence of characters back, not them concatenated together into a string. So when you compare this string to this sequence, Clojure says, uh-uh, those two things aren't the same. However, there's a little trick we can use here. There's a call function called seek, which forces a collection to be uh, turned into a sequence. So what that will do is turn race car, the string, into the sequence of characters. So it will turn that into this. And if it's already a sequence, it won't touch it. So then if we execute this, hopefully this is still true. Now this should be true. And then let's just double check that this works. That isn't a palindrome. So good, this feels like it's working. So let, let's, let's use this then to do some analysis and find the longest palindrome in Moby Dick. So we take the words. Uh, should we do lowercase? No, I don't think it makes any difference this time. But we should do distinct again. Let's. Just care about the oops, the set of words rather than every single word. And then what we're going to do is we're going to filter. Before we did a remove uh, up here, we, so we remove the common words. This time we're going to do the opposite of that. So what filter does is it keeps all of the ones that match uh, that match the, the function that you pass in. Whereas before, remove got rid of the ones that match, if that makes sense. So hopefully this should give us all of the palindromes in the book.
yeah, these single, of course, single letter words are technically a palindrome, but those aren't really that interesting. And these don't look like they're sorted. So let's sort them by count like we did before. Yep, that looks like it's working. And then let's take the last, say, 10. So these should be the longest palindromes in Moby Dick. Dude is in there, apparently. Poop, we're learning things here. And the longest word is deified. That's a nice word, and I didn't know that that was a palindrome, so that was cool. But we're actually trying to find the longest palindrome, so instead of taking the last 10, we could just take the last one. Or there's also a function that's even simpler than that that's just called last, which will give us the same result. Okay, and what we've been doing here is just creating these. Uh, it's not really a function because we haven't named it. We've not defined anything here. So we can't call these bits of code from anywhere else. So just to show you what it feels like to do that, let's define a function called uh, longest palindrome that takes words. And then we tab this in. Oops, not that one. So it takes the words, finds the distinct set of words in that list of words, filters out the palindromes, sorts them by the count, and grabs the last. Again, get a feeling for how close this is to how we would talk about it, how few characters we're using. I know there are some languages that really try to be extremely terse and really concise. And I think there is a lot of value in that. Of course, if you're getting down to just having you know, characters to describe things, you start to lose some of the clarity. So I think there's probably a balance there between clarity and conciseness. And for my taste, at least, I feel like Clojure gets really close to perfect there. So let's run that. So now we have a custom defined function that we can call longest palindrome. And if we pass in the words there, it should give us the same result, which it does. And because we have a REPL, we can test. So let's just test with a few other words that we know are palindromes. Let's put race car in again. And hopefully it will return race car. And it does. So this was pretty much everything I wanted to show you. Um, like I said, fairly basic functions. You know, we're not building a system here. But again, it's, it's more to give you a feeling for what does it feel like to shape your solutions, to build them as you go with this toolkit, this, uh, this bucket of bricks that you get with Clojure, and with bringing out the data structures to this top level. So hopefully, if you haven't seen this before, you've learned something. Hopefully, even if you'd seen Clojure before, some of the stuff we talked about before about the philosophy was a little bit interesting. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.